UCB Life Issues with Paul Hammond. And as always, a warm welcome to this week's Life Issues. Now, over the years, I've interviewed a lot of people who had transformation stories. Stories where God has stepped in and given new direction, purpose, calling and peace to lives that were hopeless, lost and in a cycle of self-destruction. The power of God to transform is something to celebrate. The renewal of a life is something to laud. The breaking of chains, well, that's an image that is redolent with biblical and spiritual overtones, isn't it? But what about the lessons of the time? The heartache, the despair, the paranoia, the anxiety that comes from, say, a life of crime. Being a social outcast as you pursue selfish gain without any thought to the hurt or harm you leave in your wake. Should that just be forgotten when a life is transformed? Subsumed into the saving grace of Jesus, washed clean at the foot of the cross, the guilt and the shame certainly should be. But what about all those people who are still living that life, who are behind you on the journey, who are condemned by their actions? Isn't what has gone before a tremendous opportunity to inform others about what drives them and also to let them see the better path that is available? That's our thought for this week's Life Issues, and I suspect my guests would agree. He is Claude Jackson, author of Guns to God, My Journey from Drug Dealing to Deliverance. It's published by our friends at SBCK. It's available now online and in good Christian bookshops. And it tells the story of a young man well on the road to being a career criminal, but who now takes his message of faith into a community filled with young men, just as he was. Claude Welcome to Life Issues. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, mate. Now, we're going to unpack some of your story and hear some of your story in a moment. But I wonder, first of all, to sit and look back from a position where you're now working at Holy Trinity Brompton. You've got a very clear calling of God in your life. You're going in a very clear direction. I wonder how hard it was for you with the sense of conscience and awareness and empathy you have, to look back on young Claude and the way he was when he was a teenage lad? Yeah, um, it was very difficult, very difficult to read the book back uh, in its final format and relive those moments. Um, I think part of the reason being that there's so much distance between the chap who I was and the chap who I am. Yeah. And obviously I thank God for that transition. Um, But yeah, to answer your question, at times it was very difficult to look back at and uh, reflect on those moments in life. There are those who would say, and and I've talked to people who have had similar background to you had and similar experiences of crime and, and gang violence and so on as you had. There are those who would say that, that young Claude, he was a product of his environment, and in some ways the die was cast for him that he would be as he was. Do you agree with that? Um, To some degree. And this is a discussion I've touched on before. Um, I think had the poverty been removed from the situation, I'd still have had other issues. Had the domestic violence not been there, I still would have had other issues. The struggling with academia, you know, I would have still had other issues. So it's just a case where, unfortunately, yes, I had a bad start in life, but it wasn't just one issue. There were several problems. And that's an important thing for for all of us to understand, I think, because it's very easy to write youngsters off. It's very easy to condemn them when they get caught up in crime or behaviours that are antisocial or they get caught up in in communities that are committed to, to crime and to drugs and to violence and so on. It's very easy just to write them off. But actually, in a sense, there but for the grace of God, that complex life, it could have been any of us. 
It could have been any of us. And the thing is, let's be honest, there's thousands of us just failing every day due to whatever the case may be, the system. Was I set up to fail? Because um, when I struggled with academics, I was called the class clown. Um, did someone just need to explain it to me better instead of sitting me in the corridor with, with, with a single desk? You know, so these are questions that one could look at and say it's systemic oppression, it's systemic of failure. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot going on. Yeah. When you looked back to start to write your story, was it hard to find the right balance between honesty and not glamorizing and perhaps the well, the modern way of telling stories that do tend to sensationalise it a bit. How did you how did you manage to keep that in check? Um, that's a great question. I think it was somewhat easier to do because I began writing the book in 2010 whilst in therapy. So it was actually my therapist that suggested I should write because some people find it therapeutic. And I was seeing her one or two times a week. And obviously, a counselling session isn't cheap. So she said, in the meantime, why don't you write? So then a couple of years later, the book got shelved or put on hold. Because at this point, it wasn't a book. It was a collection of diaries, if yeah, you will. Yeah. And then, you know, every couple of years, I'd come back and I'd add a little bit to the diary. And it was only a, a year ago or so that the opportunity arose for it to become a book. And I said, hold on, do you know what? I've actually got a collection of papers that we might be able to use. So at the time, what made it a bit easier is that I almost didn't think anyone was ever going to read them. So in regards to glamorizing something, it wasn't an option. Whereas mm. now, if I was to consciously write, I suppose it would be more tempting or should I use the word challenging to somehow glorify the story other than what it is. So that experience, and, and obviously therapy was part of your journey of faith and of development and of developing a different life, but that experience of taking a long, hard look at the reality of what you had been, how important was that on the journey of where God was taking you to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was imperative. It, you know, I believe strongly in denying thyself. And uh, as we know, it's the furnace that turns the silver into gold. So over the last, what's almost eight years now, it's been constant reflection, looking in the mirror, pressing reset, and accepting um, the fact that, you know, the rough childhood, my parents did their best. Although it was chaotic and dysfunctional, they did their best, and I have to forgive them for the mistakes they've made. And in forgiving others, I've had to learn to forgive myself. Yeah. And that was a big one for me to accept that I've done more wrongs, you know, um, than I'd like to admit. But it's just the way it is. But that is a big thing, though. The, the fact that here you are now, you are pursuing a, a life as a Christian minister. You're working in you know, a, an environment like Holy Trinity Brompton, connecting with people all around you that are seeking to pursue that same goal. I mean, I get embarrassed enough with the things that I did with as a, when I was a teenager. Do you know what I mean? But to some of the crimes that you committed, some of the activities you did, as you talk about in the book, the selfishness of, of your mindset at that time, it must be incredibly challenging to look back with your eyes now and confront that. Yeah, yeah. And, well, it has been challenging, but the truth shall set you free. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I can look back then, I can look back at that individual then and know he's not the individual now. Um, and there comes a level of accountability that's required in doing so. And God knows I, I've got regrets and I've repented and continue to do so for those regrets. So it's definitely been a process. Yeah. Mm. You're listening to UCB Life Issues. I'm Paul Hammond. My guest today is Claude Jackson. Now, his book, Charting the Journey That He Has Taken with God, is called Guns to God. 
My Journey from Drug Dealing to Deliverance. It's published by SPCK and it's available online and in good Christian bookshops, as they say. And I wonder if we might just explore a little bit of your story, because going back to that idea that the die was cast, so you're six years old and your big brother puts a gun in your hand. And that was a a revelatory moment, it seems, for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think what with the dysfunction of the, the household lifestyle, home wasn't a safe place. Like I said, there was lots of domestic violence. My brother left in his early teens to go and live with my nan in Brixton at the time. And he quickly picked up a career in crime. And he'd come back to the family home once a month or so. And every time he'd come back, he'd have he'd come back with an object and a story to tell. And sometimes it might just be something as simple as an expensive pair of trainers, or it might be a flick knife, or on this particular occasion, it happened to be a gun. I'm the youngest of six. I've got four older brothers. And we'd all gather in the back room of the house to listen to my brother's stories, my eldest brother's stories. And yeah, we was all huddled together this day. And when I pushed into the huddle to see what story was being told or what have you, he it was a gun that was being handed around. And it was when I held that gun, I got the opportunity to hold it. And it was one of two life-changing moments for me. Just, uh, I remember being taken back by the weight of the gun and how cold the steel was. Even at that younger age, uh, I was aware enough to know that the gun was made for nothing other than destruction, you know? Yeah, yeah. And in that moment and the days that followed it, there was a, a sense of the identity that you would inhabit was growing. Yes, absolutely. I think what the gun was was the window to the fantasy of what comes with it. Because all we ever see on television and the films and are these guys who are swashbuckling and, you know, they've got guns and money and the lifestyle was glorified to me. And that's what led on from six to 32. I was chasing that lie. And how easy was it for you? I mean, I know you say your, and your brother was already involved and I suppose that created a conduit. But how easy was it for you because of your love for your brother as much as anything, to embrace the idea of this lifestyle and to start to move in as a young teenager into crimes and violence and drugs and that community? Yeah, like I've said previously, uh, it was easier to get a gun than it was a degree. And that was basically the format of life. It was easier to do the wrong thing than it was to do the right thing. And I was just excluded an outcast or cast out from school, a social misfit. So everything was leading to, for want of a better word, the wrong thing, making the wrong decisions, what felt so right at the time. And what, especially in those early years, what could have happened that might have redirected you what could have happened in school what could have happened in community what could have happened in youth clubs and with youth workers and so on because there were plenty of those around in the community that you were growing up in what what could have happened that would actually have have taken young claude jackson and just redirected him away from this pathway um i think i was underrated and overlooked because I didn't fit into any stereotypical type category. Then I was thrown on the trash heap and uh, tr the trash heap was the welcome place for me. Mm. So if someone had took the time to invest in me, cause I wasn't getting that investment at home. I wasn't getting the investment in school. My social circle was, individuals more or less from a similar background, those whom had more positive and a brighter outlook to life went off to college and university. So and they just had no um, investment from an early age. So when, 
and I, I think it's an important maybe hinge pin moment, but when you were 13, you got a trial for Wimbledon, no mean feat that. The, it wasn't just that you weren't encouraged to take that route. It was the fact that also your brother kind of mocked the idea that you could, you know, play your way out of the community, out of the 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 violence, out of the crime. Yeah, absolutely. So we was uprooted. The house got repossessed and we was uprooted from Tooting and our associates in Brixton and surrounding areas and found ourselves in the middle of Surrey in a small country village called Surbiton at the time, which was considered to be in the middle of nowhere. And um, I noticed that kids in, in the school played a lot of football, more so than they did in Tooting. So, you know, eventually it was something I joined in with and I'd like to imagine I got pretty good. I wasn't bad. And uh, it was my mum, bless her, who always, um, which sounds quite contradictory, but my mum championed me in the way she could. But a woman oppressed, domestic violence, six kids to raise, you know, she done the best she could with what she had. And it was her who managed to get the trials for me at Wimbledon. And it was my only option, if I'm to be honest. I really thought this might be something else. And when I went back to the one person I really looked up to more than anyone else, my oldest brother, he quickly crushed that idea. Yeah. And then not only did he crush the idea, he took my self-esteem as well, what little I had. He said, look at yourself, you know. Why would they choose you? Look at you. Of all the kids around the, of, around the country, what makes you think you're going to get it? And, you know, at that time he was right. I was, you know, I was thinking to myself, he's right. Look at my home life. Look at my school life. You know, what chance do I have? And you can look back now and see that he was speaking out of his own hurt, his own disillusionment, his own insecurities, his own fears. But by projecting them onto you, he was perpetuating that cycle, wasn't he? Absolutely. He was trapped in the pit. And rather than see someone escape, he pulled them back back into the pit and even lower than him. So I understand, we understand hurt people hurt people. And it's all part of the forgiveness I spoke about earlier. But before you could get to the point where you started to, to look at your life as something that is positive in God, there was an awful lot of spiraling down to go, do. And, and yet at the same time, you were, if I might put it like this, you were very successful as a criminal. You were very successful as a violent man. You were very successful as somebody who wanted to to get people into drugs so that you could just make profit off them. It was um, you had a talent for it, Claude. Yeah, uh, you know, it, one could say that I was. I was. I haven't. I haven't been to prison, and uh, the only thing about being very successful is the stakes get higher and higher. Yeah. And, you know, the deals get more and more dangerous because you never had your hands burnt, so you keep pushing the barriers and the boundaries. And just, you know, I live with a billion regrets, and if I could take back every drug I ever sold, I assure you I would. And just one example, if I may share that, is some of the individuals whom I was selling drugs to through complications one way or another, overdose or what have you, died. And my own brother actually overdosed and had to have a stint in his heart. So that's just some of what one has to live with as a result. And it is fair to say, I mean, and reading your story and, and listening to how you talk about your story, it is fair to say that whilst on the surface there was this success there were fast cars there was plenty of money there was all the trappings that of, of the gangster lifestyle that that often gets so glamorized underneath it there was feelings of wretchedness of insecurity or of, of of paranoia of of depression and and on all that sort of emotional almost like an emotional quagmire that was holding your life, um, that you were, I suppose in some ways, you were covering over with the drug of your behaviours, even if it wasn't the drugs that you were selling. Yeah, absolutely. And that was well said. Nobody feels, 
Nobody feels sorry for the successful gangster. He gets absolutely no sympathy. So once you reach a certain amount of money, finances, you can no longer spend it because people want to know where the money's come from. Um, there's a ceiling to what you can do. Uh, there's a ceiling to whom you have around you and whom you meet, new associates, uh, relationships, you know. It's, um, and in the end, you're just hiding. So you just buy the vehicles to hide yourself away in them. And you buy the jewellery to hide away your real appearance and distract everybody. And eventually you hide from yourself. It gets tough to even look in the mirror. There was a certain irony about how you came to faith, though, because at first I couldn't believe it when I read that in the midst of all this, you were approached to be a mentor for high-risk young offenders for the local council. I mean, could they not see what was going on in your life? Could, could they not see what you were doing? I mean, had, had they met you? <laughs> well, it does seem ironic. Um, the opportunity was advertised and I applied for the position. And, you know, what, what, what's ironic? Who better than to mentor these young offenders. If you take away the drug dealing, I had a lot of life experience yeah. and could relate to them, could relate to them very well. So, um, yeah, but the reality was I, I was a full-time drug dealer and I was mentoring young offenders on the side. And yet you can see the hand of God in all of this and, and, and perhaps as well the sort of the ironic humour that the Lord might have in that, it was exactly that that caused you to have a moment for pause. Tell me about the change that happened in you when you did that Alpha course. Yeah. Um, when, I, when I got the opportunity to invite Jesus into my life, at that point I was so empty and my ego was so big that I thought, you know what? I'm going to take this, I'm going to take this challenge on and I'll dare Jesus. Cause they said, you can, if you feel like it, you can invite him. But I was so egotistical that I said, I'm not only going to invite him, I'm going to dare him <laughs> into my life. And when I closed my eyes and I said exactly that, I said, Jesus, I dare you to do what these people say you can do and come into my life and make a change. And I kid you not, Paul, in that moment, mate, it felt like time stopped. The silence in the room was tangible. You could almost feel it. It was as present as you and I talking here. And uh, it felt like I had my eyes closed forever, but it was only a few seconds. But by the time I opened them, I knew there and then that a shift had happened. And if there was going to be a change, it had to be made right there and then. And over the following few weeks, that's exactly what began to took place, a change in my overall life. And you let go of the, all the reality, the trappings, the activities of your criminal life. I would imagine that wasn't just hard for you to do. It, maybe emotionally it wasn't hard to do because of what Jesus has done, but, but practically... In practical terms, that would have been hard to do. But I would imagine that there were also, a bit like your brother when you got that trial for Wimbledon, there would have been people around you who were going, oh, come on, Claude, don't be daft. You need to be a part of this. It's, you know, you can't let go of this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when people start to see the decline, you would be amazed how many decide not to stick around anymore. So females that I had in my life, friends or people whom I thought were my friends when it wasn't when I was no longer cool or a top boy they just didn't want to hang about and that was difficult because I thought some of these people I thought we our friendship was worth more yeah um and even down to family members to this day uh some of my siblings still none of them talk to me To this day. So it was a case of, uh, it's a small cross to bear. It's a small cross to carry 
for what Jesus has done in my life. But that's how detrimental the decision was that not only my friends, but some of my family uh, no longer have anything to do with me. So you understand on a very personal level, as well as a theoretical level, the draws that there are for people who are in that sort of lifestyle, are part of that community, are inducted into that gang, that family. You understand that the talk that talks about liberating people from that, it's a lot easier to say than it actually is to do. Yeah, yeah, because you're walking away from so much, aren't you? Whether it's, you know, broken or not, it's it's your, it's the only platform you have. Some people, because we all just want to be recognised. We all just want to be valued. We want somebody to know our name, who we are, identify with. And uh, even if it was a bunch of thieves and villains and crooks and murderers, I'd rather be among them than be on my own at the time. So I can understand why a lot of people refuse to or even don't see the opportunity to leave because you have to give away so much. You mm. have to turn away from everything. Is, I mean, we talk a lot now about the importance of, of talking things through, asking for help and um, sharing how you feel. And especially we talk about it for men and the importance of, of, of doing that as a part of, of men's understanding of their mental health and so on and so forth. Within the culture that you were a part of, is that ever a possibility for somebody to turn and go, I need help? Um, I think it's more of a tangible option now than it ever was before. So in my day, I wouldn't have known where to start. And by the time I began getting counselling, I'd already been selling drugs for near on 15 years. So um, I think now you can go to your GP or your local police station, but back then it just wasn't an option. It just really wasn't. It really wasn't. And the thing is, we get, like you said, now men's mental health is becoming uh, important and more and more fashionable to speak about. But back then, my goodness, if I'd have told someone I was depressed, mm. what? Do you know how weak that makes you? You instantly go from the predator to the prey. Literally, by the end of that sentence, I'm depressed, you become somebody's target. And so the cycle is just perpetuated and the almost the insecurities and the, the structure of the culture perpetuate this round and round on the same track of violence to validate yourself in the light of the feelings that are pulling you down and it just goes round and round it really does and it's a case of only the strong survive and the sad thing about that is it costs people their lives people are dying in their sin and never having known jesus so one of the things what i'm passionate about is we our culture seems to be one of this shut up instead of speak up culture and um, the reason things aren't changing is because it's the age old saying, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. And an example I give of this is the monkeys in the zoo. You know, if I ask the listener what monkeys get fed, the first thing they'll say is bananas. But hey, guess what? There's a range of food that monkeys eat, but because they always eat whatever they're given, the menu never changes. And guess what, people? In society, unfortunately, it's the same. If you need mental help, ask somebody because no one's going to offer you it unless you say something. So that's one thing. We need to change the narrative and get away from this man up, be a man culture and uh, this shut up instead of speak up attitude. The, the strongest man in the room is the weakest man in the room. 
You're listening to UCB Life Issues. My guest this week, sharing in a very frank way the reality of his life, but also the reality of his convictions for the future, is Claude Jackson, author of Guns to God. It's published by SPCK. The subtitle is My Journey from Drug Dealing to Deliverance. Claude's life was a life of crime until God broke into his life and brought a transformation. A transformation that has set you thinking about what we can do and not just what we can do for people who are on that journey that you were on but also for the communities that well i suppose one of the questions that has to be asked is whether the communities that these people are part of whether they tolerate and empower these lifestyles or whether they do enough to challenge these lifestyles is it ever feasible for a community to encourage youngsters in a different direction? Yes. Yeah. Is it feasible? I think we're moving into a space where we need community activism and social entrepreneurship. We need to find the empty pockets within the community and revitalize and revigorate our communities. And until that starts to happen, I don't think we'll see change. And how do we do that then? How do we... How do we ensure that in doing that, we don't just create a stronger base for the criminal, for the, the, the young man who is, is falling into crime? We don't just create a, a richer pickings for him. Because I think we will begin to provide more opportunity when we start thinking locally instead of globally. At the moment, we think globally and we neglect what's close to us. We neglect what's local. So I believe once we start investing and harvesting locally, we'll really see things start to come to fruition within our communities because it will provide more opportunity. Do you think that then that there is a desire in many of the... Well, let's go back to 13-year-old Claude. Was there a a desire in him to actually find a different way to the criminal way? Yes, absolutely there was. And I tried, I tried through retail, um, but I didn't, I I didn't have qualifications. I couldn't get a good job. I didn't have the social skills. I wasn't equipped. I didn't have the tools. I suppose we assume often that, the inner city youngsters who get caught up in gangs and crime, that is that that's because it's an easy way to money and that's what they want to do. But you seem to be implying that there was a, a desire to almost that that was a like a, a last resort because you couldn't see any alternative at all. Yeah, to a degree. I think I've had the experience of knowing many a bank robber and killer and I don't say those words lightly because I understand the severity of the crimes but the reality is neither of those individuals as a child wanted to grow up to become either so that's why I would challenge one's perspective in regards to whether or not these individuals want to change you know but that that then creates a, a whole new opportunity and perhaps a whole new opportunity for the faith community as well because if that is the case and we can bring the reality of the transformation that you experienced of jesus and also the support for community that the church historically would have brought then actually a lot of these lives could be given if intervention can come early enough could be given a fresh new start yeah i believe so i believe the church is one body And I think we need to look for opportunities where we can, again, plug into the community and have the community plug into the church. Sometimes we get caught up in this um, culture or tradition that you have to be high upper crust or, you know, high class to go to church, which is couldn't be anything further than from the truth. No. So what for you now, then? Because... 
I know that you uh, you're working at Holy Trinity, as I said. You have been seeking ordination within the Church of England. You are moving forward along a path that you believe God has called you to, but it's not a path to sit in a comfortable parish somewhere, is it? No, not exactly. So, God willing, I get ordained next year, and uh, I'll go on to do my curacy, which can last up to three years. And uh, part of my priesthood looks looks into um, or looks like planting in urban communities, estates and built up areas where there's individuals like myself and people we've spoken about. And then maybe, you know, I'll be able to put some of this, what I've said, some of the theory into action mm. and start to really see if people can come to church and come to Jesus in those communities, given the opportunities to do so. And how much of that is, yes, about calling, yes, about desire to make a difference, but how much of that is also about Claude being able to make a bit of restitution for those days? Um... Or probably all of it, if I'm honest. I think because I think part of my calling is to seek restitution and repentance, you know. And um, my life isn't for me. My life is for the people. I want to serve others. I didn't. This isn't for everyone. This is just my opinion. But I didn't. I've come to the conclusion that my life is a gift for others. Honestly, we, if I can't help people, then I don't, I don't want no part of it. It's been great to talk to you today. As I said, Claude's book is published by SPCK. It's called Guns to God, and it's available online and in good Christian bookshops. And it has been a, a privilege and a pleasure to chat to you today. And I, I wonder if we could finish with a final thought from you, because the vast majority of people who are listening to this podcast will not have experienced the life that you experienced. They will not have seen the things that you've seen they will not have had to endure the dysfunctional family that you had to endure or the pressure into a life of violence and crime that you did and indeed the compulsion and the draw and the addiction even of that but we will still be inclined to make judgments and to paint a picture around people like teenage claude and I wonder what you would ask, what you would appeal to those of us who don't know the reality about how we think about these inner city teenage, particularly lads, black lads, that are carrying all of this and how we judge them and how we think about them. Yeah, um, for me, when I when I when I hear gang culture, I I hear frustration and resentment, and a lot of these guys are just seeking assistance and help, but don't know how to ask for it. And sure, there are some that you know are bent on living this lifestyle, yeah. but I I can assure you, for every one that is, there's two that isn't. And they just can't see a way out. And I just really l like to encourage anybody to, if you get the opportunity to mentor a young individual, you know, take that opportunity up. Because if I just had a mentor, I wonder if things would have been different, you know, and let's not write these young people off. Uh, if, there, if there is an opportunity to give them a chance, then let's, find the grace within ourselves, within our own brokenness, to look at someone else's brokenness and uh, try to show some empathy and sympathy and give them a chance too, as God's given us. As I said, Claude's book is called Guns to God, My Journey from Drug Dealing to Deliverance by Claude Jackson, published by SPCK. And the truth is, of course, it is ever so easy to look at a person who is caught up in behavior that is antisocial, crime, violence, drugs, whatever. It's very easy to look at them and just make a judgment that they are a wrong'un, a bad'un, 
that actually they're oh yeah they wanted to do this they are they celebrating the violence celebrating the lifestyle in actuality as claude's story makes clear for an awful lot of them they're just desperate to try and find a different way surely we have a responsibility as people who know the power of second chances and who know the redemptive reality of God opening up our lives to the truth of his love, surely we have a responsibility to be gracious and patient, not excusing, but being willing to see beyond in order to encourage them in that different way. Claude, thank you for joining us. Paul, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Honestly, thank you. I'm Paul Hammond. You've been listening to UCB Life Issues. Why not join me next week for another one? Good night. <laughs>